All right, get ready for this how-to video where we discuss nesting. We're going to talk about passing functions left and right. We're going to talk about a really important concept called closure, meaning like what variables are packaged along with it when we're sending functions off to go visit places and do different things. And that's what makes them first class because they have the ability to do anything that a Python object does, which is pretty incredible when you start thinking about it. And then we're going to talk about nesting and the differences in the way we can nest the different functions and what it means for how we call and execute them. And of course, closing on closure, we're going to build on the concept from the why videos where we talk about being at the post office and closing a box with a package inside of it and the entire environment of the post office going into the box also. So when your friend opens the box, he's also inside the post office. So we're gonna go through and just show a bunch of experiments and examples to see where and when you can access what to hopefully drive that concept home. So get ready, let's talk nesting. All right, let's start with first class functions. Remember that airplane seat, that first class experience, that's what we're about to go through now. So imagine yourself with all of that beautiful, you know, hoity-toity stuff going on in your on your flight. So here's what we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at functions and how they can be passed into one another. So we're gonna define a function. It's just called rando. We import the random module and it returns a random number between one and 10. So I'm gonna run this cell multiple times and you'll see that we get different answers each time we run it. So it's picking a random number. So we have this function rando. We know how to call it. We know it provides a random number. Here's the question, can we use a function as a parameter? And if we do, do we add it with the parentheses or without the parentheses? What happens? So here we're defining a new function. This doesn't have to match up, remember, because we're inside of the parentheses here. So this just has to match whatever logic it is. It is a variable in itself. This is the variable's contents. This is the shot glass, this is the liquor. We have defined a robin's nest and we wanna bring in rando. But when we do, we're gonna have some kind of re return here, and then we're gonna do some logic. We're gonna add 100. So we know we're getting a number, we know they're both of the type integer, so that should work. We should get some kind of random number here and add 100 to it and then return it if we're allowed to pass functions in as parameters. And as you probably guessed, because in Python, we have first class functions we can pass them right in. So let me just run this cell a few times and you'll see that we get that random portion, one through 10 is always added to the static 100, the constant that we get from the second function. So a cool way to think about, we have these little packages of code and they can actually be passed into packages of code. It's also easy now to start thinking about how Python really does so many powerful things. When you start writing programs that do amazing things on your phone and applications that tap into all these other resources, you can kind of imagine that you're just on the top of all of these nested functions. It's calling on a function that could be calling on a function, it's calling on a function, and they're all hidden from you, but they're going all the way down to the ones and zeros, the binary that actually runs computers or goes into huge databases and does more complicated queries just because you ask for something simple. So really cool to understand first class functions means that functions are treated as objects and they have all of those same first class rights. So we talked about passing a function into a function, but let's talk about nesting, meaning the functions are inside of the functions. So we can look at it a couple ways. First, we can think of them as separate containers where one is just going around like a kitchen and grabbing whatever it needs because it's got access to everything in the kitchen. And that's what I call this separate category. So the way to think about this in code is to define a function that does something simple, like just returns the string of text fly. Um, just we'll run that so you can see that it works. And then let's define another function. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna return bird, and then it's gonna multiply it by five. So it's kind of like our first class function here, but you might be asking yourself, but you didn't pass anything in. Ah, that leads to an interesting question. What if we would have put rando just right in there like that. What if we, in fact, don't pass in anything? That and that, does that work? Oh, it does. Look, 
we don't even need to pass it in. So it does work when you pass it in, and in some cases you want to, because you can't just have everything floating around everywhere. But it's good to know that we can grab them just like we would any other variable. So here we can just say, take that function, multiply it by five, and return fly, 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 fly. Okay, so when I mean separate, what I mean is floating out there in the environment, a variable that we have access to. It's an object, technically, but it's just an object that we have access to at any given time. Like, we could call it at any given time. We can also build some new container and put it in the container, because it's already in the kitchen. It's like out on the counter, and we can put it in the Tupperware. Stuff that's in the Tupperware can't necessarily get out of the Tupperware and get onto the kitchen counter. I must be hungry. I wonder why I'm making all these kitchen analogies. Okay, but let's look at it together. So this is another function that we're calling nest2, and inside of it is another function. So the function wasn't created outside, and then we're just calling it in. This thing solely exists. Its whole life is inside of this cage. It's inside of nest2. Bird2 doesn't know what it's like outside. But what's interesting is we can define it. It is in the scope inside of this function. So maybe the best way to think about this is to focus on the inner function first. Pretend this is all of our world. Don't worry about the indentation. All we're doing is returning this string egg. But who's going to call that? Well, we could call it down here if we were pretending this wasn't spaced out and this didn't exist. So maybe we can just add a return and then put a definition. So we're now indented one layer, and this is automatically going to get called and then returned. Okay? So, that's interesting. Egg is solely living in here, and we can't call it outside. So, right here, I can't call bird2, for example. There's nothing there. But with the separate one, I could call... Well, I already have. It's pretty obvious, but yeah, I could call bird. Right? Because it's already there. So, interesting just to think about how we nest things and where the scope of variables and access is. Let's talk about closure. So closure is one of my favorite topics, but kind of tricky to understand. So for those of you who are, like, just playing my video in the background while you, you know, like write political comments, now is the time to stop doing that and actually watch the video. Because if you don't see this, it's not going to click very easily. It's conceptually hard to understand, but seeing examples, I think, is the most concrete way to deal with it. So I'm excited for this. We're going to talk about closure with some experiments that I was testing before that will hopefully demonstrate this. So here's our scenario. We're a tiny little bird. We're like a little bird that can't fly yet, and we're inside of a nest, and we're inside of the jungle, okay? We're in a tree, like our mother bird has left, so we're just hanging by ourselves, and we don't want to jump out of the nest down to the ground because we don't know how to fly. We'll probably get eaten and, and we don't know how to get back to our place, but we can like hop a little bit. So we can like hop out of our little stick nest and we can go up and down the branches and we can pick little branches or eat little bugs, stuff like that that's on the branch, okay? Trust me, this is going somewhere. Otherwise you might end up a garbage man in the stinkiest part of town and assigned to only the stinky garbage. We have a variable here called stones3. It's outside of every function that we have. Obviously, we have access to it. It's at the top. Then we have our first function, which is our nest. So we're moving from the forest floor, where the stones are, up the tree into our nest. It's another little container. And we have inside of here some sticks. We don't have access to that variable from the outside, but if you're in this function, you do. Then we go inside of the bird. Inside of the bird, the bird has bones. So we have the variables stones, sticks, and bones, and they're at different levels of scope. So now we have this print function in the most inner nested function, and it's printing sticks, stones, and bones. So we're checking to make sure it has access to all three of these levels. We're just going to make that function. It's not executed yet, but that's the layout. Okay, so now let's just double check what we have access to. Stones 3, we do have access to because it's on the outermost thing. Sticks 3, we don't because it's nested inside of a function and we can't get to that. We haven't executed that. And then, of course, 
this function we can't even call. We can't even execute birds3 because it's inside of another function which we don't have permissions for. So that one's protected too. So now we know what we do and don't have access to. So if we take nest3, our outermost function, and we run it, it is going to return bird3, which is a call to the inner function, and it's using the parentheses so you know it's going to execute the logic that's inside of here. So it should print all of these out. And what do we get? Yes, by just calling this outer function, which then in turn calls the inner function, which then in turn says, do I have access to this, this, and this, which it does, does, and does. Okay? All right, so execution with parentheses down here. Now, let's look at it without parentheses. So this is basically the exact same, except now I've changed everything from three to four, just so we know that we're working with fresh variables, nothing's coming down the page. And one big change here is that the returned variable isn't being executed. That's different from this one, because we had the parentheses around it. So this one's just passing it in, and it is going to use closure to bring all of these variables into it, and then we can pass it around later. So, same thing, stones, sticks, bones, execute from the inside. When we define this function and then run nest4, we'll get something different. Instead of executing it, we just get some information saying, hey, this is a variable, it could be ran, but right now you're getting back just bird4, the variable, holding the entire function, and all of the namespace and all of these variables at all three layers. So we can put this variable, which is unexecuted, into a new variable, and then we can pass it around. So now we can run this, and instead of using that function to execute that function, it's just going to pass all that information into a new variable called shot glass. Makes sense. Shot glasses hold things. And if we look at this, we'll see the same thing as before. So we just passed it in, no problems there. But here's the question. When we take shot glass and we add the parentheses, is it the same as having the parentheses in here? Do you think it's going to actually execute this code? Surprise, surprise. It can. And it has access to sticks for, stones for, and bones for. So that means all of this stuff, that, that, and that, it all got packaged in here. So really, bird four is amazing. Like it was like, I'm gonna get a stone, I'm gonna get a stick, I'm gonna get bones, you can pass me into another variable and then you can execute that variable later and it has all of that stuff in it. So when we're talking about closure, we're talking about this concept that the function itself has like brought in all of these variables that are normally just floating around and I mean, it kind of makes sense that it has access to it here, but it's sort of surprising that it has access to it down here. So it's really bringing a lot in with it. The entire environment's in there. So now let's take it a step further and look at what happens when we actually repackage that variable that's holding a function that's also got a nested function, and it's got some logic that's looking at variables that are spread out all over the scopes. So here we are, stone five. This is the same as last time. We just added five to everything. Now we're going to take this. Remember, the return is coming in without the execution. No parentheses there. And we're going to put it in a variable. This is the same as shot glasses last time, just a new name. We put it in closed package. And now I've defined a whole other function. So remember, now we're kind of going back into another Tupperware container. So we are going to check to see if you can actually return it. So before I run this function, what I'm saying is I have a new function and its goal is just to return whatever is in mystery. And what I'm going to put into it is the closed package, this equivalent to shot glass, and I'm going to put the parentheses on it. So it should execute this, that should execute that, which should check to see if all those variables are there. But remember, this is now all contained inside of this can I print world. Like all of these variables that were all outside, they can't get out of this because it's enclosed in its own Tupperware. So now it's like before where we'd open the box and we'd look around and we were like actually in the post office, like everything came out of the box, the entire environment. But now that entire post office is inside like another little Tupperware container. You know, like there's another wall on the outside that we definitely don't have access to. Those variables are not floating everywhere in our code, but they will be contained inside of here. So can I print? You certainly can. Sticks five, stones five, and bones five. So pretty interesting stuff. 
just weird to take all these variables and like package them in with something and then put them in something else. And I mean, it's really just fascinating to see how Clojure works. I mean, it can let you get access to variables when you're pulling up uh, modules, things like that. So just powerful, interesting, and something that you should know about. Now go back to doing your political comments. You Republican, Democrat, Independent, or other. Channel your inner Martha Stewart for this one. We're talking decorators. You've seen this set of functions before, but the last time you saw them, they were reversed, and we had rando on top. Adds 100 to the random number generated here. And that is possible because even though it's floating in the scope of this DEC function, it can be read by the inner function. And then the call gets returned, not executed in here because there's no parentheses. It gets passed into this rando deck variable, and then we execute it with the parentheses. Okay, if that didn't make sense, watch the last video. So let's do, do. And what we get is exactly what we expected. Let me run it a few times. You can see that we keep getting our random integer added to the big number. So this is basically what a decorator is shorthand for. Decorators can be thought of a really simple way to take a general common function that you want to modify a lot of other functions. So it doesn't come up all the time, but I'm telling you that I never saw decorators like seven, eight years ago, and now they're coming up all the time. So my most recent real world example of dealing with a decorator is if you connect to Google's cloud infrastructure, they have decorators all over the place and they're really powerful because you can make a function that uh, does some kind of complicated computation and then you'll add a decorator, which are these at symbols and then the name of a function that's been defined as a decorator. And what happens is Google takes your output and then sends it up into its cloud infrastructure and can then paralyze it or do processing or host an app in the cloud. It can do a whole bunch of functionality that you don't need to worry about anymore. You don't have to write all that stuff because it's general. Everybody wants the app to be fast, so you just add the decorator at fast to your function and Google figures out how to make it go fast. So with the world of APIs and this internet of things, I think you're gonna see decorators popping up more and more. Now, what they do is sort of a shorthand. It could all be done with functions being passed into functions, but there's a lot of cases where it's just a waste of time to write all that stuff. So a decorator is something that you want to be general, something that you want to apply over and over again. Like if you had a house, but you wanted every item and every wall and the house to be pink, you could write a decorator that says, no matter what the thing is, after it's made and put in its place, color it pink, right? It's like bringing a can of spray paint in and just painting everything that you own pink. You would make that function of spray painting everything pink a decorator because it would apply to so many things. And it's really not that useful if you're just gonna do it once. Like up here, it would be just as easy to make this two functions as it is to make one function that's a decorator and then apply it. Here is a situation where you might wanna use a decorator. You might define like at the top of your code, a topping. We're gonna to think about cakes in this example as our sort of mental visual mnemonic. So you imagine the topping of like frosting and it can be put on any cake. It can be put on a chocolate, strawberry or vanilla cake. We just pass in any cake. This is a variable that we've defined. And to make it a decorator function, we just need to do, well, nothing. We just call it later using add symbol. So it's really easy to make decorators and even easier to use them. Here we pass in any cake and the cakes in this case are gonna be a number for chocolate one through 10, for strawberry 11 through 20, it'll be a number here. And then we just do the same thing, we add 100 to it and then send it back for execution. So just like what you saw up here, we only now need to write one topping function because we know that we want frosting on all of our cakes. And then on each of our cakes, we just add at topping. So the way to think about it is whenever you see that at symbol and then some kind of word, you automatically know, oh, that's some function somewhere else in my code. And once this logic executes, 
it's going to go traveling up here and go into there. So you can just take all of this and then pass it into topping and then all of this and pass it into topping. And you can see when we run chocolate cake, which you think might just do what's here in the definition, like you think the code works down. In fact, that's, that is one interesting thing is that you can always think of code as moving down the page, except in this one situation, this is the only thing that's popping into my head right now is times where you can add something above the execution line and it actually works. That's interesting. So here we call chocolate cake and it does run all of this, but it takes that return. And instead of just giving it to you down here in the call like it should, it then puts it into the topping function. It automatically goes up here and passes it into that. So you can see when we run chocolate cake, we get that random number, 1 through 10, and then it's added to 100. And we can do that over and over again, and we'll see that we'll always get a number between 1 and 110. Now moving down with strawberry, our number that's random is going to be between 11 and 20. So we got the same thing, but these numbers are always going to be between 110 and 120. And then doing it one last time, you can see it works for vanilla cake too. So you can imagine if you had thousands of these functions and you really just needed to add this little topping or you have like a handful of these toppings that you sort of memorize like shortcut functions that modify it in some way, especially something like cleaning up um, text before it goes out or like rounding digits up so that they're whole numbers because you're presenting them to the user or in some kind of a graph. Like it's great to just have a little function that does that and then you can just apply it to everything that comes out. So there you go. Hope you're feeling very much like Martha Stewart now and you're still imagining that weird pink house. Subscribe to our Mnemonic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.